When I was uh, reading the Christmas story this year, I noticed that <clears throat> God a lot of times said, do not be afraid. And I thought that was a very interesting message for this time of, of year with all the things going on. And that wh wherever God is at work, <clears throat> there, there is a 
possibility of fear. And so uh, just th think about those as, as you hear about Mary and Joseph and the shepherds as, as I read the Christmas story. Uh, Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary asked the angel, But how can this happen? I am a virgin. And the angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. And Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. And this is how the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before this marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to, to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through this prophet. Look, a virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and took Mary to be his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. At, the same t at, at that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quir Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was the descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first son, child, a son. She wrapped him in snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. And that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by the sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about their child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their fields, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Now Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod, and about that time some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. 
It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. All right, well, good evening. Let me just take a moment and just welcome you and just say we're glad you're here. Uh, we're glad that you've taken an opportunity this evening on your way to, to whatever festivities you're on the way to that you've stopped here just to, to take a moment and just have a, a time where we worship and thank God for the gift of His Son. And so we just want to say thank you. We want to welcome you. We want to say that tonight, man, we just hope that, that you just experience what you need to experience. Uh, we are a pretty laid-back culture here, and so in just a moment, we're going to sing some songs that you're probably going to be familiar with, so we invite you to sing along with us. If you want to stand, you can stand. If you want to stay seated, you can stay seated. We're going to take an opportunity to, to share together the Lord's Supper together, and again, you know, we're not a twist your arm just because we're doing it. You have to participate. We want you to be comfortable here in what you do this evening. And so we just want you to experience, again, just a, a joy and just a, a kind of a, a fresh of breath air of just being here this evening. So, again, we're glad you're here. Welcome, and I hope you enjoy the evening. Yeah. 
A couple thousand years before Jesus walked on the planet, the Bible says there was a period of time when God's people were enslaved, literally. They were, they were completely owned, completely controlled by somebody else, something else. And God saw it. And God was not satisfied. God was not pleased. That would not stand in God's mind. And so he sent a man named Moses, the Bible says, to say to the people of Egypt that had enslaved God's people, I want you to let them go. I want you to free them. I want you to release them. God's done that all throughout human history. When he looks out and he sees his people in bondage, in captivity, wrapped up in the circumstances of life, captive, struggling, broken down, beaten up, he, he looks out and we don't escape his notice and he sees it and he says, that can't stand. I, I want to do something about that. And in that story, he sent Moses to Pharaoh and said, God says, release my people. Pharaoh, the Bible says, responded to Moses' command with this. Who is this God that I would obey him? <laughs> Not an uncommon frame, I'm afraid. It seems that all throughout human history, once again, not only has God looked out and seen the bondage of his people and the despair and the brokenness and the weight of life and said that doesn't go, that won't stand. It also seems that there have always been people that says, who is this God that I would obey him? The results of that encounter, the Bible describes in the book of Exodus, between Moses saying, God says enough, and Pharaoh answering, who is God that I would pay any attention to him, 
the results were an incredible season of despair and difficulty in Pharaoh's life and, in fact, all of Egypt. Ten plagues visited them, the last of which was the worst. The Bible describes how Moses shared with the people of God that on this night, God will finally bring the worst calamity upon your oppressor. It will be an angel of death that passes through, and the firstborn of every Egyptian, including Pharaoh himself, will be killed. But God wants to spare you, Moses told the people. God wants to rescue you. And here's how that can happen. If you'll go get a lamb, a spring lamb, and sacrifice that and put the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, that blood will cover you from the consequences that God is bringing this night. And so it happened. And Exodus chapter 11 tells the story of the angel coming through. And every person that lived in that city lost their firstborn. All of the cattle, the firstborn of, of, of every herd was destroyed that night. And yet because of the blood spread on the doorposts, it protected those families. That forever from that moment on was known as the Passover night. The night when God not only rescued His people, but He spared them from the calamity that was to come because of the arrogance and the ignorance and the stubbornness and rebellion against God's instructions. It was that story that Jesus was honoring 1,500 years later when he gathered with his disciples in the upper room. Oh, that story became so incredibly part of the, of the heritage of that people. Every year they would celebrate that story of Moses' encounter with the Pharaoh of Egypt and God rescuing them. The Passover would become, and still is, an important part of the heritage of the celebration. And it was that meal that Jesus was honoring when he gathered that night, the night before he would die, in a small room in the upper part of a little place, a little house. And he gathered his disciples together. They knew why they were there. It was the Passover. For 1,500 years they had celebrated the Passover the, pat, the blood of Jesus protecting their forefathers from the calamity that would come. But on that night with Jesus around the table, he shared a new Passover story. And he began to tell them about what would happen. That in the next few days, indeed, it would be the next night, it was Thursday night, in which they gathered for that first supper that Passover meal. And the next night, Jesus was sharing with them, I'm going to be crucified. My body will be broken for you. My blood will be shed. You will continue as my people to celebrate how the blood protects you, how the blood covers you. But no longer will it be the blood that their forefathers put on their doorposts. Now it will be the blood that I shed for you on the cross that will once and for all provide for the forgiveness of sin. And so on that night, the night before he died, Jesus instituted what we have continued to refer back to. It has a number of names today. Some call it the Lord's Supper, some the Memorial Supper, some it's communion. It's, it's a moment not unlike their people of God had celebrated for 1,500 years in which we pause to remember salvation, to remember the shedding of blood that provides for the forgiveness, for the protection of the circumstances and the calamity of our own lives. And so the Bible says that Jesus not only told them what was about to happen, that he was going to die, and then that he would come back to life and he would conquer death, and because of that experience, all mankind forevermore would have the ability to be saved, to be rescued, to be protected from the calamity of their life, from sin itself, because of the blood that he would shed that night. 
And then he said these words to his followers. He said, every once in a while, I'm paraphrasing, but every once in a while, as often as you do this, I want you to do this. I want you to continue coming together to remember the blood. But I want you to do this in remembrance of what I am about to do for you. And so since those days, a couple of thousand years ago now, we have as God's people done the same thing. We've gathered together in memory of what He has done for us. Yes, of that Passover 1,500 years before Jesus, but then of Jesus' blood and the protection that He gives, the forgiveness that He offers, the shedding of His own blood that He gave on the cross that night. And so tonight, as a part of our Christmas Eve, celebration we do what jesus asks us to do to remember if you are a follower of jesus christ that is if there's ever been a time in your life when you have said yes to him you have crossed the line of faith and given your life fully and completely to jesus christ you have said you take charge forgive me and take control of my life if you are a follower of christ then the bible says you are invited into this experience of the memorial supper or the lord's supper if if that's not you, maybe you're still struggling with that or journeying with that or hearing about that, then it's an opportunity for you to observe God's people as they come to the table of the Lord and remember what He did for us. I'm going to offer a prayer. and If you're a Christ follower, it doesn't matter whether you're a part of this church or not, but if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, following my prayer, I, it, there's going to be a little bit of moment to of just kind of quietness and a little bit of music in the background. And I'm going to invite you, following my prayer, to pray where you are. And in praying, maybe something to the effect of, God, thank you for shedding your blood for me. Thank you for, yes, Christmas, but then the 33 years that passed from Christmas to Calvary, to the crucifixion. And then the three days later, to the resurrection. Thank you, God. And in that moment of quiet prayer of thanking God, when you've completed that, I, I would invite you to just to get up at when you're ready, when you're finished with your prayer time, uh, and come to the table and grab a little cup. It's just a little cup of juice and a little bit of bread and carry that back to your seat. And just a moment together, we will do what Jesus asked us to do. What God's people have done now for 3,500 years, we're going to do together on Christmas Eve. Let me pray for you, then you pray, and then come to the table. Father God, in these moments, on Christmas Eve, we pause to celebrate, yes, the gift of your son in the form of that baby, but God, more than that, that baby who grew up and became a man, and then as he was commissioned to do from the moment he left heaven, gave his life freely, spilled his blood as nails pierced his hands and as a spear pierced his side and as his life left him, he shed his blood that we might be reconciled to you, that we might know you, that we might be protected, indeed rescued from the calamity of our own lives, from the failures of our own messes that we've made thank you father for that truth and so in these moments receive our participation in this memorial supper as an offering to you i pray in jesus name angels we have heard on high sweetly singing o'er the hills and the mountains Yeah. 
When Paul was teaching about this memorial supper, he, he warned the Ephesians. He said, don't you dare take that flippantly. He said, don't you dare be casual as you come to the table of the Lord to honor what he instructed us to do in remembering his gifts. In fact, he said there are those who have done that in the past and experienced great calamity. As we this evening on Christmas Eve participate in the memorial supper, I I invite you to do so prayerfully. I invite you to do so with a heart of thanksgiving and a recognition of the great sacrifice that God has given us that we might know Him. Would you stand together with me as we now participate in the memorial supper? Various accounts say that Jesus on that night in that small upper room took bread as was the custom in that Passover feast and he broke it and he described it as being his body. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. There are traditions that believe something magical happens with, with the juice that's in this cup. It's, it's grape juice and this bread that it literally becomes the flesh and blood of Jesus there's nothing in Scripture that says that. We tend to follow Scripture and what we believe happens. And, and yet, at the same time, recognizing that there's something very, very powerful and important in the establishment of what we're doing. And so, after they had prayed as we have, the bread was passed around the table. And Jesus said, This being my body that is to be broken, I want you to take it and eat it in remembrance of me. Take and eat.
And then the Bible describes the setting as he took a cup, likely a common cup that they all drank out of. We're not doing that tonight. It's flu season. The cup wasn't the important part. It was what it meant. They had done it for 1,500 years, but now Jesus described this moment as a new covenant. He said, this is a new covenant that I make with you, a new covenant of, of my blood, because the Bible teaches us without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. There can be no rescue. I, I don't know what all of that means, but I can go all the way back to that Passover experience when Jesus, you, when, when God used blood to protect his people. And in that same tradition, Jesus said, this cup now that I'm about to give you in the establishment of this memorial is a new covenant I'm making with you now. No longer as your fathers have had will you sacrifice in order to experience forgiveness. You simply will receive the forgiveness that I'm about to make available because of what's going to happen in the next couple of days. And he passed the cup around and invited them to take and drink as a, res as a representative of the new covenant I'm making with you. Take and drink. Just remain standing and sing this with the band.
You can be seated for just a moment. Man, this time of the year really is just a, just a beautiful time of the year, isn't it? I mean, I know Pastor Mike has shared several times that this, this is his most favorite season of all. He loves the lights and the decorations and, and all the stuff that kind of goes along with that. And it really is. It's a beautiful time of the year. Many of us think that. And, and if you were to close your eyes and just think of like the perfect Christmas scenery, maybe you would think of like that most beautiful Christmas tree in the living room with a fireplace going, little stockings hung, and the, the candles, and that loving family that's in front of the tree, and, and the gifts, and, and just the joy that comes from that. Or maybe you think of that, that most perfect couple that's sitting on the love seat in front of the Christmas tree that, that fell in love because of the Christmas miracle, and they're just sharing that cup of cocoa, and they're sitting there, and it's just a warm, beautiful sight. I talked to my wife about this the before I, I decided to say this, and, and I said, what do you think about that? When you think of Christmas, does that sound like Christmas? And she goes, you've been watching the Hallmark Channel way too much. <laughs> so maybe I lost my man card, I don't know. But, <laughs> but it is, I mean, that Christmas is such a beautiful time of the year. It's a season of, of joy, it's a season of peace, it's a season of comfort. I mean, it's, it's everything that it should be. But a lot of times, it gets complicated, doesn't it? We, as people, seem to complicate things a lot. And Christmas sometimes can be complicated, and we can sometimes lose the whole message and the whole point of what Christmas is about if we're not careful. I mean, it's complicated. Family's complicated. I mean, think about family. I mean, some of you are just thinking, I said that you're thinking about where I'm going tonight and where I'm going to be tomorrow and the next couple of days, and you're thinking about how can I make an excuse to get out of that, Right? I mean, family can be complicated for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's because of hurt feelings. Sometimes it's because of broken families. Sometimes it's because of, of someone said something so many years ago and it just never really has been the same. Sometimes it's because of a loss of a loved one. But family can be complicated. It can be very complicated. Finances can be complicated. We all know that. I mean, it can be complicated because we're trying to stay in that budget that we want to stay within. And by the way, I read that I think spending is up 8% this year from last year. I think they said the average, I read in like uh, some type of a financial journal, that the average American is going to spend $1,000 on Christmas this year. The average person, the average American will spend $1,000 on Christmas this year. I hope that's true in my case and someone's spending that on me. I don't know. But that's a lot of money. But it can be complicated trying to stay in that budget. Why? Because we want to buy something for everybody. I mean, we want to get all the neighbors something. We want to get all our kids' teachers something. We want to, you know, Northbridge makes it complicated because there's like four or five pastors, and you want to get all them something. And you want to get, you know, your, your, your nephews, kids, grandma something. And, and but yet we have to stay in that budget, and it's, it's hard to do. It's tough for parents. I get it. Because we, we understand, we step back and we know that material things, that's what Christmas isn't about. But there's just something about seeing the joy on your kid's face that morning to be able to buy them what they want and get them what they want or not get what Santa's going to bring them. Sorry to help you out there, out there, parents that still have that going on. So you don't want to get the same thing, right? But it's tough. It's tough because it's just not always possible. Finances can be complicated. Relationships are complicated. They really are. Men, if you don't understand that, let me just warn you, there's still time tonight to make amends, okay? You know, relationships are complicated because let me just tell you, men, it doesn't matter how she said it. It doesn't matter if she was the sweetest, softest, sexiest, however she said it. If she said, oh, sweetie, you don't have to buy me anything for Christmas. All I want to do is just spend time with you. I'm just telling you that's a lie. <laughs> it's a lie. And if you show up tomorrow morning without a gift, God have mercy on you, really. <laughs> Relationships are complicated because people are complicated. We as Christians can even make the Christmas story complicated. I mean, think about it. There's, there's all kinds of characters in the Christmas story. I mean, we have Joseph and Mary, and we have the, the whole story that goes along with them. And we have the, the shepherds and the angel, and we have the wise men or the magi, whatever you want to call them. And you have the gifts that they brought, the gold, the incense, and the myrrh. And you have, 
You have the innkeeper and his dilemma of not being able to, to get Mary and Joseph a room in the inn. And then you have Herod and his, his fear of this Christ child. And so he wanted to put you know, all the baby boys to and under to death. I mean, we have all kinds of characters. And I'm not discounting or discrediting the stories that come along with that and the things that we can learn from that. But sometimes we just make it so complicated. And we can go through the Christmas story and we just kind of walk away going, what was that about? The Christmas story doesn't have to be complicated. It really doesn't. And so I was thinking tonight, maybe we just need, uh, amongst all the, the stuff in life, amongst all the, the things that can complicate this time of the year, maybe we just need to step back and be reminded of the simplicity of Christmas, the simplicity of the message of Christmas. Keith read from the Gospel of Luke, and in, ch in chapter 2, verse 10, it says, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. I mean, think about that. The story of Jesus started out with an angel proclaiming, This is good news. This is good news here. This is something that you need to be aware of. This is something that you need to anticipate. This is something you need to be excited about. This is good news. That term good news is eventually what we came and got the, gospel, the, the, the term gospel from. Good news. Which is what? It's the message of Christ. He said good news that will cause great joy to all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. What's the good news? The good news is the fact that God created a way for us to have relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus. Another author of another gospel, he pins it this way. For God so loved the world that He gave. For God so loved the world that He gave. I mean, think about that. That is the essence of Christmas right there. For God so loved the world that he gave. For whoever, black, white, male, female, child, adult, those who have it all together, those who don't, so that whoever would believe in him, would put their trust in, would believe in, would, put, would go all in and have faith in him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. Translated, would have a relationship with me. That's the story of Christmas. That's what we need to remember. That God so loved that he gave. He gave. And that's what it's all about. Yeah, he did it in the form of, of a virgin birth. He didn't have to, but he loved. And so he did. Yeah, there's a story of, of the angels and the star and they followed and they found the Christ child. It didn't have to happen that way. It's okay. He loved and he gave. And so in the midst of whatever's going on in your life, however complicated this season might be, whatever might be kind of going on and running around in the background of life, you want joy? You want peace? You want to feel the, the goodness and the, and the beauty of this time and the warmth of this time of the year? Remember, that God so loved that he gave, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have a relationship with him. We always end this service as a candle lighting, and so I'm going to invite you to stand. The band's going to come up and play a song. I'm going to ask you to start lighting your candles, and you're going to have to light off of each other. There's some candles in the back. There's some candles on these tables here. Take a moment and light your candles. Obviously, when we light the candles, we, obviously the light of the candle, all throughout the New Testament, all throughout the Bible, it's you know, God or Jesus coming into this world is represented as light in the darkness. And the light of the purity and the goodness that comes from only Jesus Christ in the midst of the evil and the darkness that, 
of this world. But tonight, maybe, maybe as we sing this song, maybe tonight your light might represent that whatever it is that's going on in your life and the complications, if there's complications of, with you in this season, maybe this light for you represents that peace in the midst of that turmoil. Maybe for you that light represents that comfort in the midst of whatever is going on. Maybe that light represents the joy that you need to be reminded of. And maybe for some of us, it's a light that just represents the fact that we have relationship because God loved and he gave. Join the band as we sing. All right, man, we, uh, we hope you have enjoyed this evening and, and uh, just uh, wish all of you a Merry Christmas as you head uh, your ways. If you're uh, visiting with us, uh, 
we'd love to have you back. Uh, Sunday morning, we have services at 9 and 1030. And so we invite you to come back and, and join us uh, this coming Sunday uh, or anytime that, uh, that you're able to. Also, if you can't make it uh, here, we also have an online campus. And so you can go to our website and you can connect with us uh, online as well. So again, Merry Christmas. Let me leave you with this. In Luke, the cha uh, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 10 again, it says, The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. God bless you. Go in peace.